Okay, so welcome everyone to our next webinar, Development of Agro-Environment Schemes in Post-Brexit England. So today, as you can see, we're joined by Vicky Hurd, who is Head of Sustainable Farming at Sustain. Vicky is an award-winning author, expert, strategist and senior manager who has been working on environment, food and farming issues for almost 30 years. At Sustain, Vicky manages the farm policy and related campaigning and provides comment and guidance on these issues. Prior to this role, she was Director of Campaigns and Policy at War on Want. So Vicky has been heavily involved in the Ag Agricultural Bill from the very beginning, and it's very timely to hold this webinar today, as it was announced earlier this morning that the bill now awaits royal assent. So Vicky today will touch on that. She will discuss the English Envi Environmental Land Management Scheme and where this sits in terms of other developments and where the gaps still lie for ensuring environmental protection in England. So as always, there's a chance for you to submit questions after the presentation. These will be asked in the Q&A um, session. So please, please do use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point dur during Vicky's presentation. And I will then ask these on your behalf later on. So thank you all for logging in. And Vicky, I'll now hand over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you to um, everybody for joining. Um, so as Rihanna said, I've been working on agricultural policy for, for many years, um, dipped in and out. Um, and I now run the sustain um, farming and supply chain work. Um, so this is what I was going to cover in the presentation. Um, just a little bit about sustain, um, what the key issues are with regard to environment, which I think probably most of you know. So I'll go through that quickly. Um, agricultural bill progress, as Rihanna said, um, we are expecting royal assent tomorrow. So it'll be an act, no longer a bill. That's very exciting, um, very timely. And I'll talk about ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, a little bit about the Environment Bill um, and why supply chain matters for the environment, just very quickly at the end. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I will start with Sustain. This is actually a slightly old slide of our membership. Um, we are an alliance. We've got over 100 members now. I think this this probably is, is been added to. And it's very broad church, very large range of issues from public health to animal welfare, to ethics, justice and environment and conservation. Um, a whole range of issues. So it's, it's a broad range of issues that I've got to bring to agricultural bill campaigning and um, uh, agri-environment schemes. We see things in the round and from a sy systemic approach rather than any single issue. Um, but uh, you can have a look at our website um, there. So the matters in hand, obviously, there are many in terms of the environmental impacts of our farming system and why we need agri-environment schemes to really help farmers deliver um, change on the ground to tackle the climate impact, mit climate mitigation. There's a lot that we can do with regards to land use and climate mitigation, but also we need to be able to adapt our farming systems and reduce the impact of farming system because it does cause a lot of release of greenhouse gases in the UK and overseas where we use land overseas. Um, obviously, biodiversity loss, um, major not good progress being made on um, nature and wildlife indicators. A lot of them are going in the wrong direction. And um, we've seen that over the last few weeks, some um, reports on the state of our protected areas, the state of our wildlife, etc. So big issues. Ecosystem services critical, obviously, for our food system, but also for, for everything um, that we need in order to survive. Um, so protecting the resource use. Um, we also think we've got to be thinking this in terms of public health inequality access and tr access to wildlife and access to food and trade issues um, and I, I won't be talking about those in detail but um, there's also worth thinking about what the direct impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss things are but also what the impact of regulatory um, change has and what risks there might be in that um, and we could touch on that and what consumers and citizens do um, obviously makes a big difference. So all those things are, are the context in which we're looking at agro-environment schemes. And biodiversity, um, oh, I should have, yeah, sorry, those two graphs. Uh, now I can't go back, <laughs> dear, here we go. Um, I just have said this temperature anomaly, I'm sure you're all aware of how we are experiencing uh, climatic change to higher temperatures, increased oceanic temperatures, etc. And the wide implications of those um, for uh, much more than purely weather and, and um, climatic impact, it's ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, all those sort of feedback effects as well. So a lot of impact on society, 
people displaced, access to food, etc. So those are big climate impacts. Biodiversity, we know that nature has been destroyed faster than any other time in human history, um, as the um, it bears report, which I won't try and remember what the acronym is, but um, land use is often used as a proxy for biodiversity losses and certainly not perfect proxy, but uh, obviously land use related to agriculture in the UK, 70% of the land is used for agriculture. So it's, it's a pretty good proxy for, for harm and for action. Um, and we've got some specific data there on what's happened in the UK. We've lost 41% of species decline between 70 and 2013. Um, and we don't rank very highly in terms of biodiversity intactness. I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of this data. We've got really significant data on river quality um, relatively recently um, from the Environment Agency. Only 40% are in good ecological standard. That's the top, top standard. So there are good and, and reasonable progress being made in some other areas but overall it's, it's a picture of serious harm and a lot of that is to do with the environment uh, farming and also sewage and other chemical impacts so farming obviously as a key major land use here and globally we absolutely need to have agro-environment schemes working for farmers and for the environment there is obviously a major debate going on globally in particular but also in the uk about land sparing versus land sharing and i'm involved in a lot of those debates in fact i did a talk recently um, with the organic farmers and growers and others around that which is quite interesting with with other people because I feel that it's less relevant in the UK with such a crowded aisle to spare huge areas of land um, for nature protection and to leave nature to, to itself is, is quite difficult here because we do also need to produce food and other goods from the land. I think it's more important, although there is absolutely case for having reserves and land sparing, the majority of our work should be about land sharing. So we do agroecological food production, which protects the nature and produces food and trees, et cetera. So I think that's a, it's a obviously still live debate and there's big implications of um, climate on the uh, vulnerability of our food supplies from overseas. We ought to be building up capacity, but sustainable capacity here to actually produce what we need. And that isn't the same as what the uh, supermarket sell us. Um, whole big issues there, which I won't go into. So now I'll go on to the agriculture bill and a bit about the environment bill and policy rollout. So the agriculture bill has been a very long um, process of development. And in fact, the agriculture bill, which will become an agriculture act tomorrow when the um, Her Royal Highness the Queen will sign it, um, is the second version. Um, the first agriculture bill fell at the December election. Um, and I've been working a lot on that version of the Agriculture Bill um, uh, since the Health and Harmony consultation, which was the Michael Gove consultation on where should farm policy go. Now we're leaving the European Union common agricultural policy. Um, and in fact, we've had a lot of a lot of events, a lot of um, meetings, um, and the agriculture bill was getting to a position a place in the process of um, going through the um, commons the house of commons had a committee stage and um, a report stage and it was going to the house of lords and there was lots of debates lots of amendments tabled if you look on the parliamentary website there is a huge list of amendments tabled by mps and by peers to improve and enhance and we also and, and we were doing a lot of that to try and influence that process. Um, we were also working with DEFRA staff to see if we could enhance um, some of the elements of the Agriculture Bill. And in fact, in the Agriculture Bill version two, which came out uh, at the beginning of this year, there were some really good improvements. But one of the biggest essences of the Agriculture Bill, the, the biggest thing that we'd got in the original one, and which it was retained in Ag Bill Mark two, was changing the nature of the con contract between um, state and farmers and landowners. So we'll be paying public money for public benefits or public goods to, to use the strict economic term. But I think it goes beyond just the strict economic definition of public goods. There are wider public benefits to be gained from helping farmers to do things with nature, the environment and society in mind. Um, so that's at the heart of the bill, changing that nature of the majority of the money would be going for this there's lots of issues around where the budget goes i'll touch on that but uh, that is a really big win for the environment and potentially 
potentially could be very significant in terms of turning around a lot of the um, harm caused by um, intensive farming and the wrong kind of farming and the wrong kind of land conversions that happened. It has nature, soil, climate, air pollution, many things are mentioned in the clause one of the bill which reflect the government's 25 year environment plan um, objectives. Agroecology is mentioned in the bill, not quite strong enough but it's mentioned which is great because we see agroecology as being a key to getting the whole farm all of the farm rather than just the edges of the farm or parts of the farm the whole farm working to protect food production but also nature and, and uh, ecological resources in the bill we also have ancillary support schemes and production supports and sustainable that's actually i'm sorry that's a typo sustainable I should say sustainable production not procurement procurement isn't mentioned in the bill um apologies for that um so those are mentioned and they will take a, a, an amount of the money how much we don't know but helping farmers to farm uh, more efficiently more effectively ideally with sustainability at, at um as a, as a goal as well and the ancillary support is about the things around the farm and infrastructure that could help farmers do things better and that's a, a good thing to see there because we know the infrastructure has been over the years gradually centralized and um, caused lots of problems in terms of how farmers can access markets themselves rather than having to sell into a, a very harsh competitive um, commodity chain. There is also in the bill fair dealing and transparency um, clauses, which are fantastic, and we, we um, lobbied hard for these, because if farmers can't get a fair deal from their supply chains, and that does not the supply chains at the end of it, the retailers, which are covered by something called the grocery code adjudicator and a code of practice, the rest of the supply chain had no code of practice, and we argued hard that there should be a code of practice so farmers and other suppliers were treated fairly and you'd be able to identify what practices were meaning farmers couldn't farm sustainably treat their animals or their workers properly because they were getting such a fair and unreasonable deal and it could be it can be things like timing of when they need to provide food cosmetic um perfection in what they're providing to their their um supply chain many many areas there's a huge area there so we were pleased to see that in there because that affects what farmers do on their land um there's also an, a regular food security review in the bill now which is good and um the trade standards food trade standards when we are about to get up new trade deals with other countries like the us like australia like japan we're very worried that there will be a um deals done which either undermine or st our standards by removing requirements or making subtle changes which will mean we have lower environmental animal welfare or food standards um, in order to do the deal or the deal allows lots of imports a flood of imports to lower standards different standards that we haven't got we haven't judged that as a good value for um, as a value within our food system um, that could undermine our farmers doing things because they won't be able to compete so we've been ha fighting hard on trade and food standards there is there has been a bit of movement the government's given some um, way in in uh, giving into our demands on having reporting on the uh, impact of new individual trade deals on food standards it's not putting those food standards in in a legal footing which is what we really wanted but it's now done it's over we have new amendments around uh, trade deals and there'll be a new trade and agriculture commission um so actually i've just realized it's a little bit out of date as of last night um so uh as i said big issues remain we didn't get public health as an objective into the bill we didn't get regulatory baselines into the bill there's a lot of discussion over the last three years about having regulatory baselines where do farmers get paid for doing things that are in the public interest and where do they just have to follow regulation there's lots of gray lines there that need to be very much clearer than they are now where the funding and prioritization will go to public money for public benefits will be will it be paying for nature or climate or um, animal welfare there's a lot of questions about that one of the big still gaps in the bill was the lack of accountability a lot of those measures which are listed above there are allowing the secretary of state to the power gives the power for the secretary of state to do things like provide finance for public benefits it doesn't require them to do so we wanted a lot of words changing from may to must 
or may to shell and that wasn't done sadly so it, it the secretary of state won't be accountable for for those elements because they've just been given the power to do it they're not the obligation um and there aren't environmental targets in there as well we asked for ones on climate and pesticides so that's a very very quick run through what's happened with the agriculture bill we had a huge amount of um support for our campaigns this is just the latest um one at the top there the save our standards campaign which was with jamie oliver with all our members lots of other and the nfu national farmers union many others got emails sent to mps a petition signed you can see some of the figures there really 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 huge coalition and uh, uh, amazing the Irish cushion that i've never had in 30 years really really positive to try and persuade our parliamentarians to make it um, our food standards set in in legal framework um it didn't quite work but it was very impressive and the that coalition probably will now move to the trade bill which is also going through parliament and the trade bill we have had assurance that there will be amendment in there to do with the trade and agriculture commission independent commission to review um trade deals with their impact on agri-food standards um so environmental land management elm um, or ELMS, the, the new scheme which will be implemented in England. As I haven't been able to cover in this what is being implemented in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but they're doing different versions of a scheme of support for farmers um, and with different levels of emphasis on environment and rural and farming livelihoods. So I'm just talking about the development of the ELM scheme in the UK. And up the top there of the slide is what we wanted, public money for public benefits via targeted ongoing support within a wider policy framework based on a new long-term vision for food and farming and land use. Um, that vision was, um, I would say we don't have, we have a new scheme, um, but the vision, I don't think we could hand on heart say that that's clear as yet. Um, what this government thinks should be happening both in terms of farming and, and food production and land use and I've, I've articulated that a bit in another um, in a report but I'll talk about that later but what we wanted to see is a balance between outcome-based um, uh, schemes which will pay farmers for specific out outcomes such as amount of skylarks per hectare or rivers protected or so outcome base that could be measured and prescription which would be dictating what actions they would have to take um, and that's been a big tension um, and I, it's still not absolutely clear how far DEFRA will go with this but certainly it's been moving very much from the beginning when Michael Gove was talking about we're going to be paying farmers for outcomes we won't dictate how they do it we'll pay them for the outcomes the public benefits um and that's been clearly seen as problematic in a whole although there's ways of doing that and some schemes already do that it's moved more towards a prescription-based approach um we wanted it based on strong 25-year environment plan results um, and, and more than the environment plan results. So having clear targets for nature protection, climate mitigation, pesticide reduction, and public engagement, not just in terms of access to nature, but public engagement in farming and food. That's a really interesting area that will help get better communication between public and farmers. We wanted high take up by farmers and growers, not just those who've always done agri-environment schemes, brilliant as they are. We want horticulture, we want pigs, poultry, large scale farmers, small farm, all of them should have access to this new scheme. And we wanted it based on whole farm approach and to be really pushing agroecology and agroforestry, which is the combination of trees and crops and livestock or livestock. Um, we didn't, we are very clear at Sustain that we see a real benefit in having diversity of farms, farms in the UK, of farm holdings. There's so many reasons that I can't go into now why that is important, but we see a real risk of a net loss of a large number of farms, both small and medium sized farms, because of all the um, changes ahead in terms of trade, in terms of um, Brexit, in terms of climate, um, climate um, extremes of weather etc loads of reasons why we could see a not a, a net loss of farms and we don't want to see that we think there's a really important role that a, a, a diversity of farms a mosaic of farms provides not least in terms of on-farm features for nature um, we wanted to see training advice for facilitation at the heart of the elm scheme farmers having access to free or affordable advice so they know how to do things as they go forward it's a new it's a big transition a big transformation they can't do it on their own um, and so that should be at the heart of it we haven't seen that yet 
adequately. Um, we want to see landscape and catchment scale approaches. That is one of the um, elements of ELMS. Payments, monitoring, enforcement to, to work well to uh, make sure we're getting value for money as taxpayers, but that it, actually, that it actually works to make the changes we want to see and, and help farmers making stronger links to market. And that, that's sort of slightly wider than ELMS, but linking environmentally good production with markets that are willing to pay for it, ideally closer markets where possible, and being, build um, links to local community in place and local priorities, so more spatial priorities. So um, what's been happening over the last two years? I've been on a stakeholder group since the beginning of um, ELMS being announced as, as uh, the heart of new policy. And that's been a very large um, process, lots and lots of meetings. Um, and what we've uh, been seeing develop is uh, eventually a three tier scheme. So tier one, tier two and tier three. Um, and I'll go on to a bit about how that's going to work. This um, shows the timeline that's now predicted for what's going to happen. This is on the DEFRA website. You can see it, how the scheme will develop over the next um, years. And the two years before that, there's been a huge amount of work, uh, tests and trials ongoing to test different elements of this very huge new scheme and those have been very valuable testing on the ground with farmers and land managers. Um, you've had new payment methodology work but and there's lots of ideas about how we should do it differently because the old schemes it didn't work that well um, but it is likely to be based on a new but not new way of doing income foregone plus costs. So when farmers, you know, are likely to lose income because they're using land for, for nature or reducing um, stocking levels, whatever, um, that's income foregone and how much it costs to actually do the hedge laying or, or whatever. So I think we were all looking for something new, um, but it's clear that to do with various reasons and how, how WTO accepts farm supports, farm subsidies, but also uh, it's very difficult to do it right. So I think they're going to test that over the pilot over the next, um, as you can see, there's going to be a pilot over the next few years, testing that approach and understanding how you can design the payments and the level of payments to deliver the number of um, uh, entrants into the scheme and maintain them in a way where you're actually getting um, what you want. So they might sort of tweak them and change them over time. Obviously, the six big objectives are from the 25-year um, environment plan. Some of you might recognise that, clean up water, clean air, and so on. Um, and those and indicators have been set in the 25-year um, environment plan, but they're not adequately, we don't think, connected through the legislation or through the ELMS yet to outcomes. But DEFRA have been over the last two years been developing a, a all the kind of things that they would be willing to pay for. And there's been a huge um, Excel spreadsheet of over 1,200 things DEFRA could pay for bundled into sectors, issues like soil or uplands. Um, and they're going to bundle them into to, um, groups that farmers can then buy, can then apply to um, have a, uh, a scheme on their farm say for arable or uplands or whatever um, and they could do it within tier one or tier two or tier three and within those tiers a basic a middling and a top level of action so you get more money for for bigger actions and I've written a lot of blogs on the website sort of over the last two years if you're interested in how things have developed I've just tried to provide a bit of um, narrative on that over the last two years so do look at those um, and as I said, that's the timetable. Just a bit of um, on the tier one, tier two, and tier three, and I think this is in the process of changing anyway, but I share this and it's on DEFRA website. So tier one is, is to incentivize farming for all farmers and, and um, to do forestry as well, to get some environmental benefits. You can see it's the, the first tier, getting everybody, all farmers attracted to it and to do things, to, to do management activities and processes to maintain the soil, water, air pollution, et cetera. Um, and uh, sort of ideally, all, as many farms as possible will get tier one. And I'm hearing now that they don't want to use tier one because it sounds too much like COVID tier one. And, and there is also another scheme being developed um, for the transition, because as you saw from the timetable, these won't come into play um, until um, 2024, except for the pilot farmers. Um, but they want to bring something in called the Sustainable Farming Incentive, SFI. And now that will probably replace tier one in the name, in detail, I don't know, it's still 
up in the air. Tier two is for those who are going to go further and work together to deliver targeted environmental outcomes, um, like a much sort of larger amount of tree planting or hedge um, laying and protection, creating habitats, creating um, riparian zones, sort of more creation and development and larger scale. And then tier three, landscape climate, um, catchment scale to deliver um, known national targets um, for protecting watercourses, protecting peatlands, protecting forests, etc. So it's going up in terms of scale and impact. Um, but we, you know, if all farmers got into tier one, that would be amazing if, if it actually worked and very positive. So we're expecting an announcement with the latest state of play um, and some consultation, sort of a big engagement package in November, um, possibly after the comprehensive spending review, which is the um, SHUNAC um, uh, announcement on what departments are going to get in terms of money next year. But it'll also color, cover wider policy than ELMS. So animal health and welfare um, pathway scheme, a scheme to help um, productivity on farm. As, um, and other plant health schemes, other and possibly something about the um, regulatory framework and a consultation on that, because that's absolutely key. Um, so a big package expected soon. And as I mentioned earlier, confusion over the sustainable farming incentive idea, which came around about three months ago and got everybody confused. And, and, it, and what the Secretary of State wants to do is to make sure that farmers aren't feeling like they're being penalised over the next three years because their basic payment scheme, which is the basic scheme which pays them being farmers, depending on the size of the farm, is going to be slowly cut. Um, it's going to be um, reduced in uh, value um, and the bigger you are, you, know, you get, more, get more cut. But um, that money is going to be used to pay for elms. But there was a sense that given all the other sort of uh, problems that farmers are facing, uh, it wasn't fair to see them as sort of penalised over the next three years. And there's a lot of problems with that because, it, you know, we really should be moving to a new era of environmental land management. We can go to that and debate if you want. Um, there's an ongoing co-design process, lots of um, meetings and events and confusion over the transition. I've been in lots of DEFRA sessions and their deeper dives and specialist sections on organic or special prioritization, on advice, on the payment methodology. Lots and lots of work. Um, and as I said, it links to the 25 year environment plan, but that's not absolute. And not the prioritization of where the money will go is as yet unclear and we are worried. Um, and a lot of farmers and farming organizations are worried about the budget whether there'll be adequate resources there and what the targets are, what we're going to be aiming for, how the eligibility for farmers um, develops as well. Um, I think in the pilot, there'll be real restrictions on eligibility, which I think is a shame. But um, for the um, future scheme, it's, it, yeah, there's still some um, lack of clarity. Will non-farmers, people who are doing conservation farming with a few animals or parks be eligible? There's a lot of... Um, uh, concern about that. We were very pleased that land management plans were at the heart of ELMS in the development and there was very clear de uh, DEFRA developing a land management plan process that farmers going into ELMS would have to have a plan, it being agreed. And now I'm hearing that it might not be needed for tier one, which worries me greatly because we need farmers to think whole farm. How can the whole farm be used to deliver public goods, but also to deliver um, or economically viable farming system, like using your natural systems to provide, for instance, biological pest control, um, to use your natural systems to reduce um, soil loss or flood alleviation. It, whole farm approach is absolutely the way forward um, as we face big crises of um, nature and climate change. The whole farm is important. I think that's something that farmers haven't necessarily had to do up till now. And I think the land management plan was one tool for doing that. So that's critical, as is training and advice. And I'm worried there isn't going to be adequate, affordable um, advice for farmers. They are paying for facilitation between farms when they're doing a more than one holding initiative, which is great, um, possibly in tier one, uh, tier two and tier three. They're, they've indicated there will be money for that facilitation, which actually will be very, very positive. But all farmers will need advice. Um, big questions, as I, I said, on payments, mentoring, uh, monitoring and enforcement. We still don't know how much capacity the Royal Payment Agency, Natural England Environment Agency will have to enforce both regulatory baselines being met and the public goods are being delivered.
um, and spatial prioritization, which is you know the idea that we might have particular um, areas which want particular support for um, priorities in that at that region, for you know for instance flood alleviation or particular nature sites. That's unclear about how that will work, but there's a lot of work ongoing in that. Vicky, this is your five minute warning. Oh my goodness. Requested. Okay, Environment <laughs> Bill. I was, no, I knew I'd go rabbit on too much. Environment Bill has been huge delays, as I'm sure you're aware. It should provide the targets and the um, the uh, enforcement systems. Um, and, it's, you know, we've been thinking of the Environment Bill being the targets and, and what we actually want to achieve and the Ag Bill, quite a lot of the money to, to be able to do it. Um, and there's going to be an Office for Environmental Protection. There's a lot of concerns now about the independence enforcement function. Look at the Green UK and Wildlife Country link blogs and briefings on that, which are excellent. I'm not working in it so much, but it does introduce a duty on the Secretary of State to prepare a plan for improving the natural environment. And we we wanted that linked to the agricultural bill as well so they're really closely linked coherent policies we haven't got that but we the environment bill if it is as we want it to be that will be really groundbreaking um, but one of the big things i've outlined in my report green and pressured land is that we really need to understand how um, we need to have a better way of deciding how we manage and what we do on land in the UK, because it's a very crowded land and we're not necessarily getting out right. Uh, there's a lot in there that I can't go into. And I wanted to end with supply chain matters. They can't be green unless they're in the red and also vice versa. If they're not green, if they're not protecting their resource, they won't be able to continue to farm. But there's a lot, lot of work on this, but they get 8% of the food pound spend. They take a lot of the risks, get a lot of the climatic uh, risks etc etc brexit's a huge problem we see a need for fundamental reforms in the supply chain make it fairer make it shorter make sure more of the money goes to where it's needed getting you know ensuring farmers can actually farm um, viably and sustainably and we want to see the build up of a regional food supply um, system with the right kind of infrastructure, grains, um, milling, abattoirs, um, storage, all sorts of hubs to al allow farmers to have choice in where they sell to, not just have to sell to the big multiples and the big uh, food manufacturers. If they can't do that, then it will be, um, we we'll just continue down a route where it's, it's sort of race the bottom. Farms have to get more intensive because they're still getting too much, too little from what, you know, from what they do. So they have to go more intensive, more livestock, more intensive farming with a bit of green probably around the edges. That is not the future we need for our farming. So we want sort of whole farm systems, but also attention on the supply chain. Um, I finished. Brilliant. I read through the last few pages. Um, so I do do a lot of blogs, as do my colleagues. And, and we have a farm team at Sustain, keeping people up to date with what's going on in terms of policy and legislation. And I do tweet a lot, as Rihanna knows. Um, uh, so you can keep up to date with that. I think we're going to questions now. Yes, thank you. That was so interesting that you covered so much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that. We've got lots of questions in, so let's try and rattle through them if we can. OK. Um, starting at the beginning, so back to the agricultural bill. First question is, is food production, food security considered a public good in the Act? Um, that's a very good question. And there was a lot of a lot of pressure to make that part of the Act. But no, not essentially. There's you're edging towards it with the, um, the language and with the productivity and ancillary grants that recognises that we need to have efficient and um, productive farming um, supported by government in order to continue to feed ourselves and the second way it's reflected slightly is through the food security review which wasn't in the um, ag bill mark one but the food security review and i think it'll now be annual it was going to be every five years um will um, assess the state of, of food production consum and consumption in the uk and including our imports and assess whether we need to change anything in order to make sure we're less vulnerable and more and to make us more resi resilient and as anybody who saw the guardian today they've got a story about our fruit supplies we've increasingly relied on global supplies and a third of those global supplies are seriously climate risk as a climate risk and yet that's where our fruit's coming from we should be building more fruit capacity here more sustainable fruit more orchards who doesn't want more sustainable orchards and, and good orchards and more berries and, and fruits here um, and that's just one example of where we've um, left it to the market to decide on our food security whereas this bill could help us build um, more food security and more domestic supplies ideally sustainable not intensive um, but it doesn't per se say what 
the question asked that food security is a public good. No, we had many arguments actually about whether public health was a public good as well. You can talk about that if you want. Interesting. Yeah, if we've got time, that'd be really interesting to touch on. Um, the next question is, considering the uh, bill is becoming an act, when will fa trade standards come in? When do you anticipate that will be? Um, well, trade we already have a number of standards that we've brought over from the European regulations, such as the chlorine washed chicken and the hormone beef, which are the two iconic ones. I must recommend our toxic trade report, actually, which covers pesticide standards, which is residues on food and pesticide usage and uh, uh, licensing. How it what we have in Europe and therefore in the UK is very, very different from some of the um, partners we might be going to deals with, like Europe, like the US. Very, very different standards. Um, but the um, the food standards that they're, they're going to be overseen by the Food Standards Agency here and Food Standards Scotland um, as to imports coming in. But there isn't what what is now being offered is a independent body called the Trade and Agriculture Commission, which will provide parliamentarians with a, um, a view um, based on ideally expert uh, work and analysis of the impact of trade deals on standards. But that just strengthens the um, scrutiny by parliamentarians. It doesn't actually protect the standards in any way. Uh, and I don't think we're going to see anything, unfortunately, like we, we were asking for an amendment in the bill, which would set our standards in law here now on animal welfare, environment and, and food um, safety and hygiene and so things like that. We wanted that in the bill, but it, it didn't get in. And so we're not going to have that as such. But the government would argue we still have strong mechanisms to protect food standards. I would argue okay. they are a bit weak. OK, all right. Thank you. Um, how does the agricultural bill fit in with the government's target of net zero carbon by 2050? You um, it yeah, good question. We were arguing for an amendment that would actually put that target into the um, agriculture bill, and that was rejected by, I think, eventually by the MPs. I think the Lords pushed it to be in. Anyway, so there isn't a target in the Ag Bill. Um, it, it remains to be seen what's going in the Environment Bill, if there will be a target there. I'm not, a, a, you're not following that absolutely, so it might be that it's in there. Um, and therefore, the climate mitigation adaptation financial support, which is in the Ag Bill, should be helping farmers to deliver on that objective in the Environment Bill, um, if that is indeed in the Environment Bill. And it should be a government policy anyway, because they've, they've sort of agreed it. Um, it's very complicated when it comes to land, because it's not as easy to measure as what's per hour from a wind farm or whatever. It's, it's much more complicated when you're talking about soil and natural systems, which are variable from one meter to the next you know it's, it's very complicated but they will be supporting farmers to deliver climate mitigation and carbon storage okay excellent thank you so the IES recently put out a policy report on land and soil which touches on the question of how we spread best practices in farming if the bill hasn't given as much support to agroecology as it could have done mm. do you think there's a role for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer practice sharing in promoting agroecology yeah, yeah i think it, i think that's the one thing that's going to do the job um okay. to be honest i've seen some fantastic work particularly by farmers i think farmers listen to farmers more than anybody else <laughs> and when farmers become the advisors if they're good that, that's fantastic like groundswell was initiated by a farmer called john cherry and his family and it's a it's about protecting soil through new um, tillage and other other measures and where you manage livestock and I think the advisory process and, and what the IES has done is absolutely critical because we're not going to get enough from the government so the more that farmers can learn from from experts and from each other the better what the bill has in mark two happily because we campaigned very hard for it and the sustainable soils um, alliance campaigned for this very well as well is it didn't have soil in the first one and it has soil now and soil health is one of the objectives in clause one of the bill which is extremely welcome um, and we were that was a big win so Brilliant. farmers will be able to get funding to protect soil health and, and enhance soil health and uh, stop it sort of erode erosion and, and degradation excellent um, I think this is the last question around the agricultural bill and then okay. we'll move on to Elms. Um, do you think the legislative changes and public money for public goods will help across all farms in different contexts? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think farmers have got very fed up over the last few years with all the changes, all the, all the sort of um, discussions and they yeah. feel they're being um, having one form of support that European farmers 
get the basic payment scheme it's being replaced with something for which they'll have to do more work for and so there's a you know there's a real uh risk that they will just say no i'm just going to do what the market wants and you know i'm not going to be fussed with little environment schemes so there's a, a big risk there particularly if the money isn't adequate to help them to change their practices or to do things differently or create something that it, it's absolutely critical as to how much the money and the design and whether it is as simple as it can be and designed with the end user in mind that's critical but it can't be too simple to actually not deliver and not be measurable um, in terms of outcomes. But I think what they, what Defra and Michael go over in the beginning and George used to say now is they want to be able to work with the farmers and it to be a relationship and not just a, a handover of some money and a ch horrible checking process. It should be a relationship, but that really depends on having feet on the ground, farmers able to talk to somebody, farmers able to access advice and guidance and, and so on. So I think there is some risks that farmers will just walk away. And so it's really, really important that DEFRA publicizes the new scheme and make and design it in a way that farmers can can work with it. Um, big, big question would still remain. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Okay, so moving on to Elms now, you mentioned the kind of balance between outcomes versus prescription approach. Mm -hmm. Is the evidence base strong enough to have the prescription approach at the moment? Um, I think probably not. I think there's been a lot of learning um, over the past 30 years of every environment schemes. I know mm -hmm. there's an awful lot of learning and um, RSPB, for instance, have done some really good reports on that and as have Natural England and others. Um, so there's a lot on that, but that does cover what the agro-environment schemes, the old agro-environment schemes covered, which is which is only one part of what we're trying to do now. It didn't cover climate, it didn't cover air pollution, for instance, that much. It didn't cover water that well, um, nitrates. You know, there's lots of things that were, were gaps or, or inadequately covered or, or regulation. So I think the prescriptions, um, what the, what they've been developing, I mentioned uh, 1,200 um, Excel spreadsheet with, you know, it was an amazing spreadsheet of all these things, you know, um, uh, from integrated pest management to um, putting up large woodlands, you know, a whole range of things, and they, they would be paying farmers to do those things. So they have done a lot of work and a lot of talking, a lot of analysis, and the um, tests and trials and the pilot will further refine that um, prescription base. But I think they will also go for some outcome based payments. I don't know how they're going to decide which, <laughs> whatever, that's, that's a difficult one. And as I said, there are already schemes which pay for outcomes, um, payment by results, P PB, or schemes which are run now. Um, and there's also cluster schemes which are run now, which get farmers together to deliver on a, a wider than holding um, outcome that that community of farmers want to deliver. So there's lots of knowledge to build on. And I think they are talking a lot to people and farmers and testing and trialing. I'm, I'm I feel quite hopeful that we'll get there. It's it, a lot will depend on though the budget and what what's allocated for what. Sure. Um, I'm I'm slightly worried they're not allocating enough for agroecological systems like organic. Organic should be much bigger in the UK than it is. It's much bigger in other parts of Europe, and it's it, it should be a goal to massively increase organic production. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the three tier system that's mm -hmm. going to be in place. Mm -hmm. How will they be enforced? How will the tier system be enforced? Well, you'll have a, a, a sort of contract with the land management plan, in theory, okay. <laughs> if that stays. Um, and uh, there will be, I think they're very keen on having more um, uh, farmer based reporting, um, possibly with spot checks. Um, so there, it will be relying on farmers um, saying and, and showing they're doing what they're doing. Um, and there will be an element of checking. Um, as I said, spot checks, but also possibly even um, satellite and um, drone based che uh, checking that things are being delivered, such as woodlands or um, better water protection, um, less soil runoff, things like that. They can possibly check, for, you know, um, independently, um, but they will be relying more on farmer checking and also possibly although i haven't seen anything defining how they're going to do that with the private assurance schemes like um, red tractor the organic schemes um, leaf all these schemes already exist but they're private schemes um, and they feed into a market-based system um, and obviously farmers don't want to have loads more people coming on farm to check things so the more things are streamlined the better but at the same time 
we are very concerned if there is an element of earned recognition that because a farmer is in retractor it's assumed that they're doing things right when it, i think it'll it'll be a process of development of, of the best way to enforce um i think and there will be mistakes made um but o hopefully over five years of the pilot we'll get to a point where we you know we actually do feel we're getting value for money and farmers you know are getting a reasonable contract um but as we've seen the the uh, gradual whittling away of capacity in natural england environment agency um over the last 10 years is really really bad news so how that fits with what i've just said uh, you know i don't know we need to have the resources there okay brilliant interesting question from one of the delegates do you have a feel as to whether farmers are on board with sustains view of farming in the future that's interesting we've got a lot of farmers in our membership um the nfu isn't um a member of um sustain it was for a while but when we started talking about the impact of meat consumption <laughs> they, they felt they had to leave but anyway we still i still work a lot with the nfu on areas where we have agreement um so we have a lot of farmers around the room when we're discussing our work um a lot of them are, are small farmers or they're pasture-based farmers or they're organic farmers we have the land workers alliance which are a small scale um farmers and workers um what we are have done over the years is things like surveys with farmers and working with farmer groups to develop um our positions and our um uh you know our campaigns and we want to do that more to be honest and i've actually happily got money in order to recruit another member of staff so we're able to do that more um and uh, he actually comes from a, a farming and DEFRA background so he'll be able to talk with farmers and he's done a lot of work on the ground with farmers working with them how to um, do environmental schemes and uh, agri outcomes. So we are going to do more of that and um, reflect more. What, what's interesting is we did a, a letter um, with famous farmers like Jimmy, um, Jimmy's farm, Jimmy, and uh, James Rebanks, who's a, a very well known um, upland farmer who writes, um, and sort of a whole group of farms. We've got a letter in the Times with an article in the Times calling for our standards to be protected in the um, agriculture bill, part of the big campaign. And that's brought out um, over a thousand farmers have also signed the letter. They've, uh, Farmers Union Wales, all our members have been sending out. So we've got a thousand farmers who, who are supporting us there, and that reflects the fact that they. Are interested in what we're doing that's obviously about sort of maintaining standards but we could hopefully take it wider and, and talk to those farmers more and i tried to get on farms a lot um other, obviously at the moment that's difficult but um i've always been clear that sustain which has a big um load of other work that's not to do with farming sustain must be rooted in farming work as well as food and uh, public health and poverty all the other areas that we work on I hope that answers it. <laughs> yes, thank you. We've had so many questions and we've run out of time, I'm oh, afraid. But that went you, quickly. It did, it went really quickly. Thank you so much for presenting. That was so interesting. You covered a huge amount. And it, yeah, it's a shame that we can't kind of carry on. I think we've got another hour's worth of questions to go through. Um, I'll do a blog um, on the um, Royal Ascent of the Bill. So that'll be up on our website tomorrow. Fantastic. OK, and we will share that from the IES um, page as well. So if you can't thank find you. that. This webinar has been recorded and it will be made available online, so you'll be notified as soon as that comes up on the IES YouTube channel. Vicky's details are on the screen now. If you do have any burning questions that you want to pick up with her, I'm sure she wouldn't mind you getting in touch. Um, so just to let you know, those who are IES members who attended today, you can register this as CPD. Just log into the members area and go into the CPD tool and you can do that online. Um, the next webinar that we are hosting is going to be looking at keeping global environmental assessments fit for purpose and that's on the 24th of November. So do you take a look on the IES website and you can register for that so free for everyone to attend. So thank you again, Vicky. That was really interesting. Pleasure. Great to have you on board and yeah, a really timely date to be doing this. Mm. Yep. And thank you everybody who attended. I hope that's really valuable to you. And um, yeah, please do share the link to colleagues and networks once it's available on YouTube. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.